Um, very good. I know people come to our Buddhist center on a Friday night for all sorts of different uh, reasons. Some just come because it's a Friday night and it just starts the weekend off very well. I could not believe it once. Many years ago these people came and they were really, you know, young people, young man, young woman, and they were both really sort of dressed, um, you might say like fashionably, provocatively. I said, what, what are you doing? So we come to the Buddhist center first of all, to do the meditation, listen to a talk, then we go night clubbing. <laughs> so, ah, oh, I understand that. You make all the good karma first of all, so you've got enough to spend <laughs> at the nightclubs afterwards. Well, they're a very nice couple, so why not? Anyway, I'm sure they did uh, good things. The young people enjoying themselves. But nevertheless, the people come for all sorts of different things. But there's one thing I was first taught to try and do something which is very useful, is you know, one of the parts of Buddhism or meditation which is so powerful is actually whatever you come here for, sometimes that people are upset or they're anxious or afraid, they're fed up. And sometimes say, why? Can there be a solution to things like anxiety and fear? And of course there is. But it's learning how to look at it in a more positive way. But to look at it in a more positive way, I say most of these things are like called relationship problems. It's our relationship to what we have to experience in life. And of course, you know, being a monk, I've been a monk now for 46 years, I know all about relationships. <laughs> but relationships with myself, with my mind, with my body, with my life, with success and failure, things going well and things not going so well. And that relationship is actually the, almost the heart of what we do. We call what happened, what you have to deal with right now, we call that a result of old karma is here. And sometimes people may be sick, they may be healthy, they may be wealthy, they may be poor, they may be beautiful, whatever it is, which they have to deal with. Here it is, right now. Or the people you're living with. You know, the partner, the children, the parents, the job you have, these are the people you're living with. Old karma. Now the point with the law of karma is it doesn't really matter, honestly, the sort of people you have to live with. What's or who you are. What really is important is what you do with what you have. The relationship you build with whatever you're experiencing in your life right now. And a good example of that is over the last six months or nine months or however long it is, so many people get so worried and anxious about things like COVID and other politics and stuff, and they think, ah, oh, I can't go overseas, what can happen? But we call that sort of fear, anxiety. It's called looking at the future with a negative mind. And when you have a bit of negativity, you can see all the things wrong, all the things which could go wrong, all the mistakes, and that makes you very negative. If you have a relationship with a partner and you're upset today, you can see all their faults, all the things wrong with them, and you wonder why they ever decide to live with them. If you look at yourself with a negative mind, you see all the faults in yourself, all the troubles in yourself, you think, oh my goodness, I'm a hopeless case, I'm really stuck now, because you can get rid of your job, you can get rid of your partner, but it's very difficult to get rid of yourself. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why Buddhists, we don't agree with suicide. Because if you kill yourself, you're back there again. <laughs> Called reincarnation. There's no escape. Not that way, anyway. But instead, we don't try and change what we're dealing with. We change the way we deal with it. Very simple difference. You don't try and change the world. You change the way you look at the world. How you relate to it. So, 
instead of being afraid of the world, what might happen, you change the way you look at it. And instead of looking at all the things which might go wrong, you look at all the things which might go right. Which is amazing, I've lived long enough now, I realize that a lot of stuff in life we go right. Oh no, that's okay. Very good. Oh, they've got to go somewhere. Okay, bye bye, have a nice day. <laughs> you look at all the things which might go right in life instead of all the things which might go wrong. And that has been a great balm in my life. Whenever I give talks and people walk out and I think, oh my goodness, I've said something wrong. <laughs> but many years ago I thought, wow, if more people walk out, then Dennis won't ever invite me to give a talk again. I can stay in my monastery peacefully meditating, relaxed to the max all the time. Either way, I look at it <laughs> so you win both ways. And I tell many people, even in relationships, I wasn't born a monk. <laughs> even though my mother did tell me, I don't know if I remembered it correctly, but I sort of remember her telling me that when I came out of her womb, I had no hair. It was a sign. <laughs> it was an omen. <laughs> but anyway, and I was just a normal boy. And I still remember just being dumped by my girlfriend. Oh. Many people in a dump, long relationship, about six months, and she dumped me. Uh, but you know, I never felt sad. Weird, isn't it? Instead I thought, freedom! <laughs> Maybe I can get some, save some money now. Because <laughs> it's true that even boys these days tell me that girlfriends are very expensive. You be careful, you know, they, they really cost a lot of money. <laughs> They don't really, but it seems that way. But when you had a positive m attitude towards life, I thought, well, you know, just they come and go. Old karma is gone now, and I can maybe do something better. And of course, I became a monk, which was, whoa, thank you, girlfriend, for dumping me. If she hadn't have dumped me, I may not have had that chance. So you always look at things in a positive light. You may have lost your job. Great! How many people complain about having to go to work on a Monday morning and all the stress of life and all this stuff? And you lost your job. Yay! Now on Monday morning I can have a rest or do some meditation and just enjoy myself. But a lot of times people don't ever see the benefits, they always see the faults. Well, I lost my job, I've got no money, why did they sack me? To this day I've you know, gone to places in Hong Kong and Singapore and other sort of you know, modern economies. And I say, whatever you do, if somebody offers you a promotion, don't take it. You're crazy to want to be promoted. You know why I say that? It's because you get promoted, you do get more money at work, that's, that's true, but it's never enough. Doesn't matter how much you have, it's never enough. But what's really important is if you get promoted, you get more stress. And you've already got too much of that, for sure. So why get promoted and then just get more stress in life? Who wants that? Do you want more stress? If anyone wants more stress in life, come over here, we'll, we'll I'll join you on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a stressful committee, I want it's good fun. <laughs> so, sometimes we look at things in a different way. What is our purpose and meaning in life? So we don't look at the future and think of all the things which might go wrong, we think of all the things which might go right, and if they do go wrong, we make them right whatever happens in life. You know, that's been a whole journey of the COVID thing of the last, I don't know, how, many, how many months has it been now? It's been a long time. Anyway, January or something, all year. But anyway, we can always make something wonderful out of it. Weird, isn't it, to say that? Yeah, some people die, and that's always a tragedy for many people, but when they do die, that sometimes, we you know, we look at death, that's a really important part in Buddhism. You know, we're always thinking of death, but sometimes as a Buddhist, you know, we realize that we have many lives. So we can come back again. What would you like to come back as? You know, I've got this little piece of paper in my, uh, in my um, little bag here, and it says, a little question, who am I? 
Who am I? I can uh, get up in the morning and I don't need any caffeine to actually to be cheerful as soon as I've woken up. And I can eat anything at all, I never sort of complain. And uh, I, people can actually ignore me sometimes because they're too busy to look after me in a bad mood. I don't mind, I'm always happy. And I can just live just very comfortably anywhere, I can sleep anywhere. And when I do go to sleep, I don't need any alcohol or drugs to be able to have a good night's sleep. And you know, who am I? Dog. Yes, right, the family dog. <laughs> Think of a family dog. Family dog, they don't need a cup of coffee in the morning when they get up. They <laughs> <laughs> They're always nice to you, because I went to a house today, there are two beautiful dogs at the house, really big, a big one and a small one. I was surprised how big the one dog was and how small the other dog was, but they're really nice dogs. And you can see just how relaxed they were. They could eat anything, even though the, the, uh, the owners were, were vegetarians. We had some meat, so you know, we did slip a bit of meat to the two dogs. They were very happy. I had this, I, when I was a vegetarian many years ago, I was staying in a house with a vegan cat. <laughs> At least the owners tried to make, get their cat to be vegan. <laughs> and they feed it soya milk. I was a vegetarian at the time, so when the owners weren't looking, I slipped the cat some milk. Oh, the cat really loved me for that, you know, some cow's milk instead of soya milk. <laughs> That poor old cat. Anyway. <laughs> so the relationship we have to what we have to deal with in life, yeah, you can get very negative and upset and that's not a way to treat a cat, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, oh, not a way to treat a dog. But anyway, when we talk about like the bigger picture of, of like rebirth, it means you've got lots and lots of chances. Many of you come here because you're having a difficult time. Don't worry. They will pass. But I'm dying. Don't worry, your next life will be better. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. <laughs> and sometimes when you see a bigger picture, it makes... You know, I always think that one life is not enough to do all you need to do and to learn what you need to learn and to grow as much as you need to grow. Look, even make a, a simile of like schools and universities. Can you just go to university just for one year and learn everything which you really need to learn at university, just one year? Of course not. Even if you work very hard and study very hard and just go to every class, you still don't learn everything. Even one life. It's been so short. Even, I'm, how old am I now? I'm about 69. Oh, it's gone so fast. Oh, how many more years have I got? When I start saying things like that, a few people start to get worried. So I jump up, please, 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 please. <laughs> please live a little bit longer. That's really unfair. Really unkind. You know why it's unkind? Because the older you get, the more you ache, the more your legs get weak, the more your arms get weak, the more your eyes start to go and you can't hear very clearly. But one thing I've noticed with elderly people, the older you get, it's true, your arms get weak, your legs get weak, your eyes get weak, your ears don't work as well. There's one part of your body which gets stronger every year, which gets even tougher and uh, more powerful. This, your mouth. Old people can really talk. <laughs> <laughs> and I prove it. <laughs> So I may not be able to walk, I may not be able to lift my arms or see or hear, but I'll still be able to give a Dhamma talk every Friday night for the next 30 years, Dennis. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so the relationship you have with life, you can see already, you can see how you can give a positive aspect to whatever happens in life. Something you can learn. So when it gets down to life, this is what life is. Disappointments, not going the way you expect, aches, pains, difficulties, separations, deaths. But it's what you make with what you have. Your relationship to life. 
And to make this very clear, a long time ago I asked people, are you, are you one of these people who love life? Do you love life? And a lot of people say, yeah, I love life. But you love the, the nasty part of life, the disappointing part of life. When life doesn't go the way you want it to. Do you love that part too? If you love all of life, even the difficult parts, the sicknesses, the deaths, the losing your jobs, if you do like that part too, then you're somebody who has a very good relationship to life. Because that part will happen too. So how can you change your relationships so that whatever you have to experience in life, that you know you can have some fun with, some joy with. I'm going to start this explanation with something which I used to call the 70% rule. And the story behind this was a time when I was a, believe it or not, a school teacher. Because I taught in a high school in uh, Devon in UK many, many, many years ago. And as part of this anecdote, nothing to do with the main part of the anecdote, you know in those days that you had to you know, spend one week taking the morning assembly. It was a state school, mostly Christians, but I was a Buddhist then. And I asked the principal, is it okay if instead of just you know, reading a book or something to the 650 students from 11 years of age to 17 years of age or 18, you know, uh, co-ed, is it okay if I teach them some meditation? And that was in 1974. You know, no, no. Yeah, it's 1973, I think. And so, for five days in a row, Monday to Friday, in 1973, I got up on the, the platform there, in front of the headmaster, in front of 650 high school kids. And I told them, okay, cross your legs, straighten your back, close your eyes, and watch your breathing. And they did. And that was one of the most amazing things that they all, every one of those children, complied with my instructions. Not one of them messed around, even though they'd never heard anything called meditation before. And for five minutes they watched their breath. And then afterwards, okay, you can come out now. And I still remember this, no exaggeration, that at the end of that five minutes of silence, which the teachers said, Hall's never been this quiet. <laughs> And they, they actually clapped. They gave me an ovation for that. And it was such a wonderful thing. I know that many people teach mindfulness in schools these days, but I was far ahead of the game. That was 1974. 650 kids all silently meditating. And of course, what's the result of that? Oh, many years later when I was visiting the area, this gentleman came up to me and asked this question, which you should never ask. Do you remember me? <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of those kids. He said, you taught me meditation. And he said, that changed my whole life. I remember him saying that to me. It meant a lot to me as well, something which I'd forgotten about so many years earlier. And it changed because of the relationship you had to what you're doing. And sometimes people, how can you just sit quietly? You've already heard me say during the meditation instructions that relax, how do you feel? The mindfulness and the kindness which you learn because after a while you find that works. It relaxes the body. It relaxes the mind. You never start off perfect. Oh, there are sometimes I work very hard and I'm tired. I'm getting old now. Actually, that's wrong. I've got old quite a few years ago. <laughs> but there's a few things, aches and pains, and oh, well, how am I going to deal with that? got some hay fever as well. How do you deal with that? It's karma. This is real. I can experience it. But how do you experience it? One of the things which I learned 
a long time ago, is you can't get rid of the difficulties in life. If I've got some hay fever or aches and pains, you can't get rid of them and try and take some um, medication or drugs or you know, wave a magic wand to get rid of it. You're stuck with it, it's there. But what I learned, instead of giving it ill will and trying to get rid of it and trying to change it and, and get it to disappear, to give it kindness, it's wonderful compassion to allow it to be, to say to whatever you're experiencing, I don't know why you're here, but you're here and you're going to teach me something. And I recall all the teachers which I had to be under at school, and you know, my teachers, I never liked many of them, but many of the ones which were the most hurtful sometimes, I learned the most, the most from. And I noticed that in life as well. So many of the difficult experiences of life, they weren't pleasant at the time. But later on I say, thank you for being there. I learned so much from you. So I realized that all these achy, painy, difficult, it shouldn't happen this way, why did they do this to me sort of events in life, which you can all relate to. A lot of the times I learn so much from them, I grow so much from them. And the simile, which I've often given here, first time this season, because this is the first talk this season, the old treading in the dog poo. If you haven't heard that before, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> I say this at monastery everywhere I go. You go home from this talk this evening, and on your way, before you even get in your car, you go squash, you know, that squashy feeling when you, you tread in dog poo. And it's all over your shoes. And what do you do with the dog poo which you step in? It's not your fault, that stupid dog and the owner, they should you know, not you know, pick up the dog poo afterwards. And that's all over my shoes. But instead of complaining about it, you must always take it home with you. Get in your car, maybe just, you know, put your feet up or something, let somebody else drive so you don't get it all over the steering wheel. No, no, don't put your feet on the steering wheel, I mean on the pedals. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get home, that's when you scrape the dog poo off under your mango tree or apple tree or whatever else you grow in your garden. And imagine, just obvious, isn't it, when somebody tells you the dog poo is some of the best fertilizer. The more it smells, the more powerful is the oomph in that dog poo. So take it home with you, <laughs> dig it under your mango tree or apple tree, whatever you've got there, and I will guarantee one year later, your mangoes will be sweeter and more juicy and more delicious than ever before. There's so many of them and they're so incredible that you even give them to monks like me, which is correct because I gave you the instructions of how to make the most best mangoes in Perth. <laughs> and when you bite them and all the juice starts to drip down your cheek and you, oh, this, the thing which people forget, you forget what you're really eating. <laughs> it is true, isn't it? It's, it's dog shit. <laughs> it's been transformed into delicious mango. That's the best simile which I've got to describe what happens in life. So all the difficulties of life, <laughs> And I tell that story a lot to when I go and teach cancer groups. All the difficulties in life, you can look upon them as fertilizer, opportunities to grow, to learn, and to be a better person afterwards, more kind, more compassionate. So when I do my meditation, whatever I come across in meditation, I don't try and get rid of it. It's too important to get rid of. Everything is too important to get rid of. 
I stay with it and let it teach me. It's one of the reasons why that the silence of the mind is important. Just like when I was at school, if I, you know, as a, a student, if I was talking, I wasn't listening to the, what the teacher was saying. I missed too much. And I was so quiet that he could learn and take in lots of the information. And that's what I do in life a lot, even like walking through the forest. Being so quiet that even, <laughs> I think I showed you, didn't I, this? I found three four-leaf clovers in monastery. Did I show you? It was, no, I showed somebody else. There's three four-leaf clovers, real four-leaf clovers, not fake ones, in our monastery. And a four-leaf clover, that's supposed to be really good luck. If I had any money, I'd buy a lottery ticket, but I don't gamble, so. <laughs> it's still very lucky, real ones. So anyway, why do, you, why do those things happen to me? It's because instead of walking through the monastery um, forest thinking, or just, oh, what am I going to say this evening at the talk in Nolamara Temple? Or who am I going to see? Why do I have to do this? This is unfair. I'm supposed to be a simple monk. I'm supposed to be saying in my cave meditating. Why me? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? All the complaints which go on between your ears. I just on a, a, a side here that you know, somebody, people ask, and I tell them, You've been a monk a long time, good meditation, can you read people's minds? And I say, look, your mind's not worth reading. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> Who wants to read a trash pulp fiction novel? <laughs> it was a real good novel, maybe, you know, just, but <laughs> most people's minds aren't worth reading. <laughs> so anyway, that's the sort of mind you're just thinking so much, talking so much inside, worrying so much, which is one of the big problems with people, or being angry, this person did this, this person did that. Your relationship to the events is all wrong. Don't worry about things, or don't get angry about things. Who does that help? And who does that add suffering to? If you get angry, there's one person which will always hurt, and that's you the person getting angry. There's always nice little stories and anecdotes about anger and how to teach people not to get angry. There was this one, this was ancient Greece, and there there was a teacher, and he had many, many students, and he teach them everything. But every time any one of those students did something stupid, and the teacher would shout at the student, the teacher would charge a few extra dollars. It's reasonable, it's logical. Shouting at someone is a lot of effort. And the, you know, it's, it's not the teacher's fault that the student did something wrong. The student should pay the teacher an extra five bucks or something for being so stupid that the teacher had to shout at him. So this young man, he studied with his teacher for many years. Every time he made a mistake, the teacher would shout at him, he'd hand, have to hand over another five bucks. But when he graduated and got a job in Athens somewhere, Every time his boss shouted at him at work, this young man would laugh. <laughs> the boss shouted at him again. <laughs> and they wonder, why do you keep laughing at us when you get told off? Could you do that at work? When somebody shouted at you, could you laugh? Or was your partner? They shouted at you, told you off, and you go, <laughs> <laughs> Could you do that? They said, why are you laughing at it? He said, well, look, when I was a student, I had to be paid when people shouted at me. Now I get it for free. <laughs> That's why I think it's so funny. <laughs> and you can see what's happening there. The person's changing their attitude to what they're experiencing. And they realize anger just hurts you, first of all. And anxiety. Do you really know what's going to happen? If you really knew what the future was going to be, and you started worrying, fair enough. That's a good argument. You know, you're worrying about something you know is going to happen. But no one knows what's going to happen. One of the 
powerful teachings of Buddhism, the future is imper impermanent. No one knows what's going to happen next. Oh, this story comes up. It's one of my favorites. It's no one knows what's going to happen, but people think they do. And so on this one occasion, it's very memorable for me, very traumatic for me as a young monk. Not traumatic, actually, it was good fun. I was called to Royal Perth Hospital, ICU unit. The gentleman there, a Buddhist, was dying in the ICU. And the family wanted me to come straight away. So I had to drop everything I was doing and just get a car and just go to the ICU, raced in there, and what's wrong? And there's all the family were there. There was a Chinese Buddhist man, you know, you know, not, not really old, but you know, elderly. And so I went in there and, you know, I think it must have been during the rains retreat when my meditation is full strength or something. And then I really did some really good chanting for him. I really, even you know, a full power. Zap, 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 zap. <laughs> And it, <laughs> this guy, you know, he was, had his eyes closed, was in a coma or something. You know, he came out of his coma, he opened his eyes. And the doctor was, wow, it's like a miracle. You know, he's, you know, he's probably going to survive now. And I thought, so proud of myself, you know, just, oh yes, I saved another one. <laughs> <laughs> and when I told the family, they were so fed up at me. Honestly, they were really disappointed. And they said, Ajahn Brahm, don't you know we've all, they'd actually, truly, they'd already arranged a funeral service for this gentleman. <laughs> Everything arranged, and they'd even, they'd all come over from so many different countries, from Taiwan and Hong Kong, I don't know from where else, to be with this man one of their family members for the last time in their life, we all come over to be with them and just we arranged our funeral service and they said, we didn't want you to chant for him to get better, we wanted you to chant to have a peaceful death. <laughs> I did the wrong chanting. <laughs> but I never... <laughs> <laughs> I never felt guilty about that, because they didn't tell me. It was an emergency, I rushed in there without asking, and I assumed. You always think that they want the person to live. And surely that's the thing you want. <laughs> so they, they were very wealthy people. They gave me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no ung pal, no donation. <laughs> Just get out of here. But I, I'm not uh, upset, I'm not angry at them, they're angry at me because I learned something. Whatever happens in life, <laughs> you always have a positive attitude towards it to learn from it. I grew from that. Now, if you ever notice, if ever I go to, you know, maybe uh, your bedside or someone else's bedside or, you know, when they're sick in hospital and you ask me to do some chanting for them, I'll always ask you, what type of chanting do you want? <laughs> Get better, get better soon or die peacefully. <laughs> that way I don't make the same mistake again. <laughs> so, whatever happens in your life, you can always do something with it. Which makes life free of worry. What are you worried about? Lose all your money? You can, you can always go off to Dhammasar and become a nun if you lose all your money. <laughs> Get dumped by your partner? Hey! Wonderful, now you're free! Lose your job? You can take a rest, take a break. Where's all those places you'd love to go in life? Uh, in West Australia, of course, because of Covid. <laughs> Where would you like to go to travel? down to, to Margaret River, or to, to Albany, or Esperance, or go up to the Kimberleys. There's so many places you can go, but you can't go there when you've got a job, when you're busy working. So sometimes, sometimes you look at whatever happens in life, wonderful, I've got some free time now. And see what happens next. 
Because the future, again, so uncertain, no one knows what's going to happen next. But sometimes, have you ever heard of fortune tellers? Do you believe in fortune tellers? You know, sometimes I look at the horoscopes and I read them out to the other monks. And I say, uh, well, it's, it's your birthday on uh, Monday. So October, what's October? Libra. Libra. I said, you're a Libra. And then I read out sort of the horoscope that day. And I said, this is a horoscope today. And she said, oh yeah, that's very good. I'm terribly sorry, I read out the wrong horoscope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because it's his birthday, I can't resist this birthday story. This, true, my birthday, many years ago. And on my birthday, it's so hard to get a present for a monk. What does a monk need? And nothing. People ask me, what can we get you? Nothing. I said, but I got you that last year. Yeah, but I haven't finished it yet. I need some more. <laughs> Give me some more nothing. <laughs> but this fellow, he was a Malaysian ex-lawyer, very wealthy, and a very nice man, very kind. So he decided, he didn't tell me, he just said, you know, about what time of day were you born? And as far as I remember, it was about 5.30 p.m. on 7th of August, 1951, in UK. Oh, he said, and I didn't really know what he was up to. But on my birthday, he came up and he said, I spent a lot of money getting a professional horoscope of you one of the best astrologers in the whole of Australia. Cost me a lot of money, but it's my birthday gift to you, Ajahn Brahm. Would you mind, he asked, if I read it out? I said, okay, spent all that money, why not? So he read out my horoscope for that year. You know, by this really professional, expensive, you know, uh, astrologer. And he said, for anyone who's born at 5.30 p.m. in the UK, on the 7th of August, 1951, I started reading out all the different steins which were in alignment or in conjunction or whatever else. And he said, it began with, this coming year, the next 12 months, said the person who did the horoscope, will be a very, very good year for romance. <laughs> <laughs> we never got past that line. <laughs> we all laughed our head off, especially me. <laughs> totally wrong, because I'm still a monk. <laughs> no romance here. <laughs> but it, instead of asking for the money back, you just say, no, what a wonderful joke that was, and what a wonderful entertainment that was for my birthday. I'll always remember that one. So it wasn't a waste of money at all. <laughs> but the point was, you can't predict the future. Who can? Or maybe. There are better fortune tellers than people who read horoscopes. So this is my teacher, my master in Thailand, Ajahn Chah. He was very, very, very powerful. Very deep meditation. Incredible. And I put my hand up. You know, Ajahn Chah passed away quite a few years ago. He did have psychic powers. Sometimes he could read people's minds. I remember he read my mind once. On the retreat side, do you want to hear this story? Yeah, come on. Because this is a deep part of this talk. Many of you heard it on retreats. But when people give really good talks, I mean very deep talks, they're inspiring. And on this occasion, Ajahn Chah came to the monastery where I was staying and he gave a talk and that day it really hit the spot. And everything being explained so beautifully and just, oh, your, your mind is just so inspired and peaceful and joyful. And then, you know, we had actually built a sauna for him. You know, saunas were not invented in uh, Sweden or wherever. They had saunas in Buddhist monasteries in India from the very beginning. They talk about it in the ancient books. You know, saunas for the monks and nuns. And uh, so we built him a sauna. And he came over, so he gave a talk. I was so inspired. Ajahn Chah went off to the sauna 
And I was basically so inspired with so many other monks looking after Ajahn Chah, I decided just to go around the back of the hall and sit quietly meditating. I just I didn't want to waste that beautiful energy, cross my legs two hours or oh, just blitzing my head out. Beautiful meditation, so deep, so peaceful. And of course when you go in deep meditation you just don't know how long. But you no, know, two hours it was. When I came out of that meditation afterwards, the first thought was we got lots of joy and peace and happiness is to do something good for your teachers. So I decided, well I'm probably too late. Let's go and walk, see if I can be of any service to him. So off I went walking towards the sauna. And I was too late because he'd already finished the sauna, he was walking back with his driver and another Thai man. And we would cross the path. And as we were about to cross, he looked at me. And he looked, you know, sometimes like only great teachers can really look at you just looking right into you. And for once, for once I didn't mind him looking into my mind. Other days, no. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> but that day my mind was, you know, just after a very deep, beautiful meditation, so pure and so peaceful, so bright. And it's very hard for me to, uh, to make you believe this. But many of you know that I'm honest, as I don't gain anything out of these stories. But you can actually feel him. This is my perception, which I remember very clearly. Inside your mind, just having a look. Just checking around, like going in somebody's room or house and just having a walk around. And I just, yeah, please come in. For once, I don't mind you having looking around. Today is, is quite clean and peaceful and beautiful inside. And then when he emerged out, this is just how I felt, okay? His body didn't disappear and just go up my nostrils or anything. This was just, you know, his mind coming into my mind and reading everything. And afterwards he looked at me. Very, you can't say kindly, you can't say fiercely, it was some other expression on his face, just grabbing your attention eye to eye. And of course my name is Ajahn Brahm, but the full name is Brahma Wangsa. So he looked at me and said, Brahma Wangsa! quite fiercely, but kindly. And then he said, why? And he looked at me with so much kindness, but strength. Why? And I was you know, still only a young monk. And my answer was, I don't know. And he laughed his head off. These stupid Western monks. <laughs> He was trying his best to try and enlighten me. He saw I was very peaceful and give it a shot anyway. But whenever you do something stupid like that, idiotic, you know, as far as wisdom is concerned, Ajahn Chah just burst out laughing. Our idiotic responses and behavior caused him so much pleasure, so much laughter. I think that's why he had so many Western monks in his monastery, to entertain him. <laughs> No, there's a lot of kindness there too. But then he became serious again. And he looked at me once more. He said, Brahma Wangsa, I'll tell you the answer. And wow, I was really excited. This great monk was giving me a personal teaching. Just after come out of a deep meditation, and he asked me the question why I got it wrong. But he wanted to tell me what the answer was. The answer to the question, why, from Ajahn Chah. He looked at me, I'll tell you the answer. And I was so excited. And he said, my me awry. Any Thai people here? Oh yes, you know what that means? He said, there's nothing. There's nothing. And then he looked at me, I said, Brahma Wangsa, do you understand? With a lot of kindness, and I said, yes. And he looked at me again and said, no you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and he went away. <laughs> oh, that really hurt. <laughs> 
But what a beautiful lesson that was. Just, just when he gave me that wonderful answer. What's the answer to the question, why? Why? The answer is, is nothing. Do you understand? No, you don't. <laughs> but one day you will. Seeds have been planted. That's one of the reasons why. The learning. Difficulties, we get disappointed, we don't understand things, we lose things. Our relationship towards that, you know, in partnerships, things don't go right. Oh, come on, give your partner a break. If you think that your partner is hopeless, terrible, selfish, mean, nasty, controlling, narcissistic, whatever else, if you think your, par <laughs> your partner's like that, you know, your partner probably thinks you're the same. I've often said that. You know, you're both faulty. That's why you're a match. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that. Oh, that's right. This, this wonderful Buddhist woman over in Singapore. And as she told me this story, it's actually from her real life. When she got married to, to her yeah. husband, they're still together, a wonderful couple. When she got married to her husband, her father had a quiet word with her new husband. Her father took her husband aside, they'd only been married in a couple of hours, and said, you probably love my daughter a lot. He said, yeah, oh, she's so wonderful, so beautiful, so charming, everything about her is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's like when you first get married. You think that my daughter is so perfect, so beautiful, so charming in every way. But, said uh, the father-in-law, after a couple of years, you'll start to see the faults and defects in my daughter. When you start to see her defects and faults and her mistakes, I want you to always remember this, son-in-law. Always remember this, if my daughter never had those faults to begin with, she would have married someone much better than you. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of truth in that, as well as wisdom. So okay, I better finish off now, I've been wandering off all over the place with relationships, a relationship tonight, some deep stuff, some shallow stuff, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk so far, and also just about, it's not what you experience in life, that's not the creates anxiety or unhappiness or anger, it's how you relate to it, how you respond to life. So instead of responding with all this negativity which creates unhappiness for you and happiness for others, Ah, oh, come on, get real. You make mistakes, I make mistakes. That other people are just getting angry at you. You get it for free, so you can always laugh. <laughs> and whatever happens in your life, you can always learn from it and make peace from it. It does pass. There's a clinical psychologist and told me today, just, and she's one of our members, so, do you use all these teachings in your practice? Said, oh, yes. What's the most important teaching you use in your practice as a clinical psychologist? And she said, this too will pass, anicca. It doesn't last. What a wonderful teaching that is. To know that if you have COVID, if you have schizophrenia, if you have trouble with your partner, if you're get bored with this talk, don't worry. <laughs> it will pass. <laughs> and it now has passed. Thank you for listening. <laughs> okay, so now we have time for questions. Uh-oh, we have questions from overseas. Oh my goodness, I'm in trouble now. Okay, a couple of questions from overseas and then from the floor here. Full speaker. This is from live stream audience. From Johnny, how is meditation supposed to, how is meditation supposed to help me when I'm waking up in twenty six degrees Fahrenheit, homeless in my car? I'm not going to make it the rest of the month. I've had it. My country stripped my life from me as well as my savings. 
You can always see something positive in whatever happens to your life, Johnny. Uh, you're waking up in 26 degrees Fahrenheit, that's pretty cold. Yeah, homeless in your car. I have been homeless before. Sometimes we say we're homeless monks, but we have a nice place to stay in. But you're homeless in your car. There's so many kind people in this world. I don't know what country you, you are in. There's many kind people in this world. You've got to ask them for some help. Be kind to them. You're not going to make it the rest of the month. Are you sure? If you think you're not going to make it, you probably won't. But if you have that positive attitude that something's going to happen, it probably will. There's you know, one of the, the great novels by um, Charles Dickens. They had this gentleman called Mr. Micawber. And Mr. Micawber was this very, very positive man. And even he got so bankrupt, so poor, he was in debt, and they put him in the debtor's hospital together with his wife and kids, I think. Did he have a wife and kids? He had a wife anyway. And this, they asked him, said, you know, well, you're in debtor's hospital now, debtor's prison, sorry. If you were in debt, you went straight to jail. And said, what are you going to do? And Mr. McCorber would always say, something will turn up, something will turn up, and it always did in his life. And eventually he became a very good clerk and had a wonderful, you know, rest of his life. But that whole attitude, I remember that from the book, from Charles Dickens. They called it Macorberism. That something will turn up. And it does. Which is amazing. My country stripped my life from me as well as my savings. No. It's taken something off you. But you've got something left. Don't let anybody take away your peace and happiness and your positivity. I mentioned this for many times. Actually, during the Rains Retreat, we had a robbery in monastery. They broke into our donation box. And I don't know how much do they steal? I don't know how much they steal. But instead of getting angry at them taking donations, I say, they can steal our money they can wreck our donation box, so we have to fix it up again. But they'll never let them steal my happiness and my forgiveness and my contentment. We wish you well with that money. We can't get it back. So let's let you have a happy time. No, probably smoking meth, or whatever. Do you actually smoke it or take it? I don't know. What. I'm so old. <laughs> But anyway, just we know it won't let you take our happiness away. You can steal everything else, but not your contentment, not your wisdom, your kindness. And if you protect your kindness, your wisdom, sometimes your endurance, and your ability to take, please excuse me, take lots of shit and learn how to dig it in, you'll find in your life no one can take anything from you. Not the important stuff of life. From Germany. How do you look at things in a positive way if your body constantly irritates you due to chronic pain and short breath after operations? How can you relax in meditation? The meditation, if you try and do something, get something, change something, you're going to have more stress. So I mentioned this to someone earlier. What I call the Emperor's Three Questions type of meditation. Now is the most important time. The experience right in front of you, right now, whatever you're experiencing, that is the most important meditation object in the world. What you're experiencing right now. Not the breath, not limiters, not anything. Just whatever you're experiencing right now. That is your meditation object. And what to do is to care for it. Give it kindness. You find that's incredibly powerful. I do that a lot. The Emperor's Three Questions meditation. If I'm tired, if I'm hot, if I'm um, sick or anything, I sit in my cave. Right, now is the only time I have. That's an obvious solution. This is the only time we have. It's right now. What I'm experiencing right now, I'm going to be with it. The suffering comes when I want to get somewhere else. I want to get rid of it. I want to 
take this away, it shouldn't be here. That is called suffering. So instead of having a bad relationship to what I'm experiencing, I'm with it. And I'm kind to it. Because I've found that the kindness, compassion it has huge effects on lessening the suffering and the pain. Well, the Buddha said that, you probably heard this before, the two darts or two thorns, the physical and the emotional. Physical, th you know, wound, that's part of life. The emotional one, that you've got a lot of control over. You can let it go, you can be with it, just part of life. It's more um, dog proof for my mango tree. That is changing the emotional part of the, the pain. When you do that, you find that's 95% of the pain. Gone. So, if your body constantly irritates you due to chronic pain and short breath, thank you for having a short breath. I'd rather have a longer breath, but short breath is wonderful. Thank you for breathing. And you learn so much from it. And you can grow so much. As I've seen many, many people you know, in my life with chronic pain. There was this one, this one guy years ago, I have to mention him, that he came up to me and he said that his pain was so great that he, hello, <laughs> his pain was so great that uh, uh, Osmond Park Hospital, there's a pain clinic over here, they told him that he, his pain, they did the scans exactly the same as if you're having your arm cut off with a saw, not a chainsaw, two-handed saw. If you or I were cut off like that, that's the pain you would feel. He was feeling that 24-7. You could see the scans on his brain. And I looked at him, and he was just so peaceful and happy. He got used to it. He'd actually um, got past it. So life instead of pain. And when you see what it can be done, it's a difficult one, but he could do it. So that's the only choice you have if you have chronic pain. Don't try and get rid of it. That's the key. Learn to be with it. Take away the emotional part. What do you do when people you live with, work with, neighbours, other drivers get very angry with you? How do you deal with very angry people at the moment? First of all, run. <laughs> so they don't harm you. So, <laughs> but don't just run, obviously. Just try not to go to places where angry people are. So you don't go to the pubs. You don't go to the football matches when somebody loses. You just, sometimes people get very angry with you. Just, now be peaceful. And they find they can't upset you. There's one case, this monk of all people got really angry with me in front of other people in the monastery. And this monk, and I was actually wiping my bowl with a rag. He said, Bravo, monk, so that's a Filthy habit. You shouldn't wash your bowl with a filthy rag like that. Was that impressive? No, not really. Okay. <laughs> I don't usually get angry. But anyway, he was so angry at me. And I realized I had a choice. I could get angry back, which was fair. But no. I want to try something else. And I remember just, this was done with a lot of willpower, I must admit. I don't usually use willpower, but I really wanted to punch him or something. <laughs> but instead, instead I just went over to the rag bag, I changed over and got a proper cloth and started wiping my, my bowl. And all the time, I could see all the monks had gone quiet. They wanted to find out what happens next. We didn't have TV in the monastery. Or I didn't sort of see anything interesting. And this was actually you know, drama, something happening. So anyway, I went over there and I just uh, changed my, my bowl lid. I changed the, the, the rag I was using. And then I looked up at him and so did everybody else. And he went red in the face, bright red, embarrassment. And he walked away and he never got angry at me again. It's amazing, I've said, this is the way to deal with anger. So to show people that it's only changing a rag, that's easy enough to do. 
but to say that I'm not going to argue back with you. And that was a powerful lesson, I always remember that, and try and teach other people. If someone gets angry at you, they say, do it this way. If some other people are watching, other people have to be watching first of all. <laughs> and then just go and do it. And they look at him. Now what are you gonna do? It worked that time anyway. William from Denmark, the Dalai Lama says sleep is the best meditation. Do you agree? <laughs> With all respects, if the Dalai Lama did say that, it can't be the current Dalai Lama, it must be the Dalai Lama of, of a few generations ago. But it's not the best meditation. Oh my goodness. When you really get into deep meditation, you don't need sleep. And you're blissed out. Wow, that's far more powerful than sleep. And Last one, Conrad from Belgium. Your speeches are wonderful. Hey, I'm very grateful for them. Yay. How do you define happiness? <laughs> That's how I define it. Don't define it in words. How about define it in actions? How does it feel when you're happy? We're just too much into words in our current world. Trying to capture them with concepts instead of with emotions. How do you keep your happiness in a world full of fear and materialism? It's not full of fear and materialism. There's some beautiful people in this world. Kind, giving, loving, sacrificing, serving. So that's what I look at. And lastly, Pauline in Paris, I want to thank you for your speeches. 2020 is a difficult for me, not only because of COVID, and because of you, I survived. Ah, isn't that nice? from Pauline in Paris. I'm just reading it out, that's what it says. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it's not here, Pauline in Paris. See, you can check. <laughs> okay. So anyway, <laughs> you know, a lot of people find it very difficult to accept praise. Not me. <laughs> I don't get embarrassed. <laughs> And people want to hide criticism. Oh no, I didn't do that. No, no, it wasn't me. <laughs> but I hide, I hide criticism and I give the praise. <laughs> okay, so thank you all. Okay, any questions here? From here? I've gone a bit late, but it's first talk. Going, going. Go on. Okay, so thank you again for coming today. We can now bow. Oh, let's do it afterwards. Yeah. So now bow and then we can go and have a wonderful evening. Don't forget the Katina at the Nuns Monastery on Sunday. Gichigana, Green Road. Ooh, goodness gracious. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs>